Translation of Patton Skills, live from the ICP. Hi, my name is Anne Jung. I work as a consultant for global health at the Frankfurt NGO Medico International. And I will be talking about how politics and pharma companies prevent fair access to COVID vaccinations. Let me quickly talk about Medico International. Medico was founded in 1968 in Frankfurt with the aim to provide medical emergency services and aid during catastrophes. And you can see some pictures already. In the mid 1970s, Medico shifted its focus onto politics. Uh, going away from exporting drugs and putting a spotlight on to how drug pricing works and the role the pharma industry plays in that process. Since then, medical advocates for changing unhealthy living situations and today supports project partners in more than 40 countries worldwide. This drug exporting effort was re replaced by long-term support of local project partners, supported by campaign efforts that initially were very critical of the pharma industry, and thus we arrive at the topic of this talk. The news about the success in developing a vaccine for COVID probably had a bigger impact on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and then in the slums of Dakar and Nairobi. Here you can see images of, uh, on the first picture, you can see Ethiopian workers that work as domestic workers in Nairobi. And who have been sitting on the streets or living on the streets since the major explosion and waiting for the return home, all the while being very exposed to the virus. Here you can see an impression of uh, Nairobi slum, the Kenyan capital. Many there are, this is also a picture from Nairobi, are too poor to get good quality masks. This is an image from Moria, the refugee camp on the Greek islands on Lesbos. They, not just since the fire, they were ex very exposed to the virus because the health care provided isn't sufficient and they definitely won't be among the first to receive the vaccination. This last image shows the Palestinian refugee camp in Beirut. No one is safe from COVID-19 until everyone is safe from it. This is an insight that we probably all share, including German Federal President Steinmeier, who emphasized it during a speech before the World Health Organization, WHO. Even anyone who defeats COVID within their own national borders will be jailed within them if it's not defeated everywhere. Ursula von der Leyen, the newly appointed EU Council President, also says that the vaccination is our universal property, like the commons, and stresses the universal right to health. That means the deliverance from the virus necessitates a global effort, and no one will honestly oppose that. But there's this one small snag. The governments of the industrial nations prevent just that the fair access to the vaccine for all human beings. It's easy to see that Germany, Europe and other industrial nations that only make up about 14% of the global population have already secured more than half of the vaccine that is yet to be produced. The rich nations 
have already reserved more than 5 billion doses of the successful vaccine candidates, while only a small percentage of them is available for the poorer countries. You can see this here. If you take a look at the map, if you look at Europe, if you see Europe and the USA and other industrial nations, they will be among the first to have access to the vaccine. Yeah, now it continues. And the poorest countries, many among them from Africa, will probably be among the last to gain access. If you look at the policy making decisions, it quickly becomes obvious that the industrialized nations still stick to a neoliberal policy that puts the right to profits for companies ahead of the fair access to, 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 uh, ahead of the human right, especially the fair access to the vaccine. That means this order of inequality is being defended with all available force, which you can take somewhat literally. This struggle for access to the upcoming vaccines uh, shows you how the crisis is supposed to be solved, i.e. by taking advantage of the poor. The side effects will be deadly and will lead to a sharp increase in economical and social inequalities. An increase in poverty and certain diseases that cannot be treated sufficiently anymore like HIV, AIDS, malaria and many others. That means there will be a, a renaissance of the uh, global divide in North and South, even though this uh, is supposed to be abolished if you listen to uh, Sunday speeches. There are no, there is no shortage of alternatives. Uh, a short while ago, the governments of India and South Africa have petitioned um, the WGO, so the World Trade Organization, not the WHO, for an exception to the TRIPS agreement. The TRIPS agreement uh, regulates or governs patents and trade-related aspects of international property. The two governments argued that they need a fundamental and comprehensive suspension of patent regulations until the global population has reached immunity against the virus. This uh, CHIPS treaty, which is still controversial, was uh, concluded in 1995 at the initiative of industrialized nations and international companies. Interesting also Pfizer, which was one of the manufacturers of the COVID-19 vaccine. But there's also other companies that are better known in the world of chaos, like IBM, HP, Microsoft. And especially Microsoft is important because uh, for, for something that I want to explain later, it's the one of the companies with which the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation generates its capital and which is also very important in the realm of the global health. The explicit goal of the TRIPS agreement was to to secure the patents against public interests and by and wiping away all the concerns that the global concern the global south was already uttering back then the treaty provides for exemptions that allowed in the state of an health emergency um, via compulsory licenses or parallel imports and thus bypassing patent protection. The waiver that was proposed by South Africa and India um, 
benennen, includes diese Ausnahmesituation, denn es ist klar, uh, an exemption. Im Moment ist natürlich And it's clear that we have an exceptional situation now. Situation globalen Ausnahmen. Since it's obviously a global crisis regarding the health. Dass der Schutz des geistigen and the intellectual Versorgung mit property protections Produkten, should um, afford for timely supply with affordable medical products and thus the production of generica. Generica are drugs that have the same ingredients but not the same brand name and are thus a lot cheaper than the original drugs, which clearly is in the interest of um, poorer countries. It's a great idea that the two countries have had. And even the federal government, so that the German government should be excited. Let me quote again, no one is safe from the virus until everyone is safe. But it's not working at all. The US, the EU, the UK, Norway, Switzerland, Japan, Canada, Australia, Brazil, they all rejected the proposal outright. Almost 100 countries, all from the poor countries in the global south, are excited to support the proposal. But since the WTO has to agree or has to decide on all proposals via consensus, a few countries can just block the will of the majority. There are 164 countries within that um, organization, so 100 is actually overwhelming. An interesting thing I want to note is how the vaccine was developed. The main argument against this exception at the World Trade Organization is that without the pharma industry, there will not be any development of new vaccines. But if you look at this overview, you don't need to look at it in detail. It's enough to look at how much of it is blue and yellow. You can see that the majority of the funds for the vaccine development was given by the public or through government funds. But also alternative foundations like Gavi and the Gates Foundation, while a much smaller percentage was provided by the pharma industry itself. So we can actually deduce that these vaccines are our common property. But we can actually see that the risk, so the, the funds that were actually provided or covered by public money, while it's, it's already clear that the profits for the pharma industry um, for the vaccines will be quite high. You, here you can see the development of the stock price after the announcement of the vaccination. So it's fair to say regarding the discussion at the World Trade Organization that the universal right to health is um, subordinated to the right to profit. And this is even more scandalous since we have many years of experience about the kind of dramatic effects this choice has. If you look at the HIV and AIDS crisis of the 80s, which is definitely still happening today, up to this day, more than half a million people die as a result of HIV and AIDS. As a result of the patent regulation, which the TRIPS agreement is just an example of, every price reduction of HIV and AIDS medication had to be wrangled from them by a 
a global fight for the right. And tens of thousands had to die because of the high drug prices from AIDS alone. This is the reason for the title Patents Kill. Nevertheless, this explanation that there will not be scientific research without the pharma industry is, is still stuck in the heads of many, even though it's just not true. The governments of the world provide billions for R&D. The EU alone is involved with six and a half billion. Those are mostly public funds large sums of which go to drug companies without changing the price politic for the future vaccine in, in public interest. So it should be obvious and self-provided that there needs to be a democratic control and it should be known uh, the prices at which the vaccines are sold should be uh, public knowledge. So politics, unfortunately, did not learn from the experiences of the HIV AIDS crisis. But they stuck to the logics which I just uh, elaborated on. The trade um, manager of for example, said that um, incentives for innovation are um, provided by patents and also the EU said that there is there are no um, there's no evidence that the uh, um, COVID-19 vaccine politics leads to inhibitions, but it's obvious that um, it does, in fact. The negotiations at the WTO are still ongoing, and we can only hope and only exert public pressure so that industrial nations um, will change their shift and accept the proposal by South Africa and India. So, as, a, as an intermediate uh, conclusion, we could say that um, the industrial nations' governments still are not ready to work on their systems and adapt them. Now um, we're getting from the WTO to the WHO. Costa Rica, with um, support from the WHO, made a proposal at the very beginning of the pandemic. Because the WHO soon knew about the danger of the patent regime towards um, a fair distribution of the vaccine. So that is why um, with uh, Costa Rica's initiative, they founded a COVID-19 technology access pool, short CTAP. CTAP was created in order to share um, patents, know-how, data and software and um, facilitate transfer. You know these concepts from IT, and um, it's a very good approach to have this knowledge open to everyone so that everyone can develop them further. This is not a revolutionary approach, because we've already had it in, in the HIV-AIDS crisis with very good results. 
Hier konnten sich nämlich Verfahren durchsetzen, It helped create processes that made it possible for prices for drugs for um, HIV and AIDS to be um, made fairer. So how did this go on? 40 countries joined the CTAP initiative and not surprisingly those were mostly countries from the global south. Only Belgium, the Netherlands and Portugal joined from the European countries. Almost all the big pharmaceutical industry having countries didn't um, didn't intervene. And also pharmaceutical companies were quick to react. Pfizer, for example, called the proposition, the, the proposal dangerous and pointless because uh, instead it was um, suggested that pharmaceutical companies could make voluntary contributions and almost all the pharmaceutical companies agreed to that because they said it worked so well in the AIDS and HIV crisis. Patents impact how a pandemic or an epidemic um, impacts the um, population numbers. Aber eben überhaupt nicht revolutionär, so, weil beide innerhalb ja des Patentsystems irgendwie. This isn't revolutionary because it is still in the patent debate. Einfordern. Dennoch, um, still, the industrial nations chose a different path. Um, um, they reacted differently to the crisis. It is clear, and it, becomes, um, it always only becomes the clearer that they stick to their old principles and that they actively prevent development. Of course, they have their own interest because they know that politically they will have to find a way and that is why they do exactly what has been so typical of the industrial nation's pol policies so far. Public-private partnerships are the prime principle that is applied here. There was an initiative called ACT that um, was uh, in the context of the COVAX initiative where vaccination initiatives work together with the WHO and other organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which in recent years has become one of the most important private funders of the WHO. So I hope that you know um, how this all works together, but we'll repeat it again. The TRIPS agreement that led to the crisis in life-saving med uh, medication was on Microsoft's initiative among others. The TRIPS agreement led to the profits and it led to a huge growth in process, um, profits. And that money is now being used in, to finance vaccinations.
Und das Ganze zusammengenommen nennt man. And that is uh, philanthrocapitalism. Ist also nicht die Ursache, wie viele auch. As many um, behaupten, der Misere. Many uh, Symptom, conspiracy die theories der say. Um, Und deswegen ist es auch folgerichtig, dass have um, opinions about that, but it's very important that. That patents remain untouched because the foundation does not want um, these patents to be eliminated. So the new vaccine alliance gives private investors room or the opportunity to um, provide funds that um, that is clear, but it is not stressed enough that um, vaccinations should be a public good and that countries of the global south are still be stuck in their role of waiting for help that is provided voluntarily and not in a legal, within a legal framework. So. so, we see um, that patents make medication more expensive, and that is why we chose the slogan, patents are expensive but unfair. And this unfairness is not just about the vaccine, here you can see a demonstration of textile workers in Pakistan from a Pakistani union and they have huge economic difficulties because their deliveries were not uh, taken and this just this is just for context this is not just a question of vaccines but also other capitalistic impacts on production other impacts of the pandemic this is a more optimistic picture. This is, those are Cuban um, health workers who went to South Africa to support the local um, health, in, health industry. So the solution would be very easy. If we want to fight the pandemic, it's essential that we eliminate pat uh, patents on vaccinations and medication. This is a small film from our organization describing the problem, which I also just described in the talk. And the solution that uh, vaccinations must be public property, and um, it calls to sign our petitions. So let's get to the conclusion. A global health policy can only work if we apply humanitarian principles and if we globalize patents. Who do the patents belong to? The people. And the um, polio vaccine creator said that the vaccine um, belongs to everyone and just as well as he wouldn't patent the sun, he wouldn't patent his vaccine. And this is how polio was eliminated or almost eliminated. 
So we need something else than the models proposed by the industrial nations. We need policies oriented towards the benefit of global health. We need to treat patents as in the hand of the people and we must limit the power of pharmaceutical industry. And it's necessary to adjust the prices for medication so that innovations are made available to anyone. And questioning this principle only means that you question the whole system and that that isn't going to happen on its own. So this is why we um, created a global initiative to make political, exert political pressure. What is interesting is that it's working. We are taking first steps. People are becoming aware of how unfair the prices for drugs and medications are. And we can only hope that um, those who get the vaccination first will feel like um, we feel when we were clothing unfairly produced in the global south. So I'm very grateful to have been able to talk about this in this format, in this Congress. Thank you for the presentation. We have some questions from the internet, and I'll start right away. A question from the internet. How would we develop um, the, uh, the drugs so that they're affordable? This question about financing is um, something that is posed to us a lot, but the assumption is that without pharma industry, there is not going to be any development and or R&D. But in our point of view, this has been um, calculated and there are many organizations that stress that it's definitely um, they can be financed from the public funds with public money because we would save so much money in the long run. And already, it's, it's already true that m many of the funds come from public money. And you will get a good result if you just switch to a financing where it's all public. And we're, we're not demanding to um, disappropriate the, or disenfranchise the, the drug industry. We're, they, they will definitely earn a lot of money still from um, the production and uh, distribution of funds. But we also support a claim to um, cap drug prices. Thanks. If um, governments are providing funds, shouldn't it be public good? Yeah, this is basically the gist of it or the, the core of the question. At the moment, we have the situation that the risks are being shouldered by the public, by all of us, whereas the drug industry is responsible for the long-term uh, problems and the profits are being privatized. The absurd thing about it is that there are a lot of contracts, including uh, the German Republic and the pharma industry, and it, they don't involve the final price for the drug that is being developed. The, the terms are not clear and they're not being met. 
and at the same time you can see a, a deficit of democratic um, involvement here. Yeah, another um, question that fits this, would um, poor countries even have the possibility to create those vaccines themselves? Not automatically. It's clear that on the African continent, where I'm rather knowledgeable, since I'm responsible for that region within my organization for many years, there is definitely a shortage of production capacity. And definitely the production is very complex. And you, you can't just tell a textile um, manufacturing uh, a factory to just switch over to to drug production, and we would have to have started that earlier, but it's definitely we, true that we also need to think longer term, just even after COVID, the problem doesn't go away. But for example, in many Asian countries like India or Bangladesh, there are many factories that are already producing drugs for the West even, and, but it's also true that this production has been weakened by the patent regulation regime and it would already be possible for many of the poorer countries to produce the drugs that they need. Follow-up question. How about uh, production bottlenecks? What kind of uh, production bottlenecks do you see? Just for your example. Well, regarding the Corona vaccine, it's interesting to look at the look at the news in Germany. It's, it's already true that BioNTech is not able to produce the vaccine as quickly as would be needed right now. And it's already being considered to um, offshore that or to put to it in other sites. And even in this new capitalist um, or neoliberal regime, we're already thinking about licensing and franchising. And and that the recipe for the vaccine is being passed on to them because this is a problem that threatens the whole of humanity and that needs to be solved. And now that it's, there is a problem in Germany, we're starting to think about this, even though we denied their claims beforehand. And the core of the problem at the moment is that there's a lack of political will. It's easy to get funding for stuff that that, that affects the, the industrialized world, but not for the, the rest of the world. The next question, how many companies are part of the TRIPS agreement and how many profits did they make from that? Not like it's just companies that um, sponsored the TRIPS agreement with, with the WTO are the ones that are involved. The regulations um, extend to all companies, so there's also another talk today here at the RC3. There are smaller companies that build a kind of um, interest group want to uh, propel the uh, protection of the IP and want strong pro patent protection. And Pfizer was also involved in that, but fundamentally the, the pros for the companies for the allgemeine Bevölkerung um, gleichermaßen gilt. 
it's for the well, society as a whole. Another comment from the chat. Somebody is asking if companies, I think it's about licensing patents, uh, wouldn't it also be a possibility to something about patents? That's definitely a possible solution. That's actually the, the same thing that the WHO is proposing. And they're not uh, announcing socialism, but they actually made a very wise um, proposal to get the, the vaccine in the safest and quickest way possible to all people. But it's also true that these, these licenses are not given out voluntarily. It just didn't happen at all. Considering, for example, HIV and AIDS medication, but there's always some licensing fee that has to be um, paid to all the involved companies, and then it's produced somewhere else. But most of the companies don't want that. Uh, AstraZeneca was doing it. That's why there's already a lot of vaccines that are being produced in India. But the others are trying to oppose that. And politics um, have a lot of levers on, on several different levels. And there are exceptions in the TRIPS agreement, but there's also the possibility to um, declare a global emergency or a global medical emergency with WHO, and then there are certain public safety regulations that you, or laws that you could employ for to have extra options and if you take all that into account you see that the the governments of the western world made a very conscious decision to uh, put the profits of the companies ahead of the public safety and yeah none of this actually makes sense from a health perspective do, um, couldn't poorer country just ignore the patent, not just because of Corona, but uh, generally? Well, that have been afforded to the very poorest of countries in the past, and they fought for that over years, and they paid a very high price for that. I mean, you have to take that title literally, patents kill. Many 10,000, probably hundreds of thousands of people have died because they didn't have access or affordable access to necessary medication. But the danger for these very poor country is very real. It's, for them, it's just not possible to get access to Corona vaccination. I mean, what are they going to do, steal it from the production line? or? and then just distribute it, but even, even that wouldn't be possible, really. If countries said, we need to produce drugs, it's just in the public interest and critical to the, to the health of our populace, then they were punished by uh, cancelling their uh, development funds, for example. This is a very ugly, right? even on a sim more simple level, we could see that. For example, in Mexico, when the government uh, tried to ban certain highly refined sugars imported from the USA because they had a spike in type 2 diabetes, and then the US employed the trade agreement NAFTA, um, the us, using that treaty, the American sugar industry sued the Mexican government and they were forced to take that back. 
Und das ist eben so you see there is a Entscheidung gewesen, die das möglich gemacht hat, dass there is a, a risk to the public safety with the way that these uh, treaties are set up. There's always the question of, of human rights on the table when you do these trade agreements. And the profits always get priority. So, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but thank you again for this fascinating presentation and for answering our questions. There are some more questions, but unfortunately, we don't have time. You can email me with the questions, actually. And we're also reachable on um, medico.org, and you can send us the questions by mail, and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. So, to the chat, to those watching the streams, go on the Medico website and ask your questions. Now, um, on to the Herald News Show. Have fun um, during the next few days. See you.